Good morning and welcome to worship with the people of First Presbyterian Church, Edwardsville, Illinois. Uh, earlier this week, I returned from a trip uh, which involved quite a bit of furniture moving, first from my uh, mother's place in Michigan here to Illinois, and then a little bit later uh, moving some excess furniture down to our kids in, in Mississippi. So I want to say thanks to all those who supplied leadership during my absence, in particular to our guest preachers, Kaylin Stevwing and John Higgins. Today, we're grateful to everyone who's providing leadership, including videographers John Hallquist and Scott Hagen, and our musical leaders, Elliot Voss and Elaine Vey. No, we pronounce it for me. Way, thank you. <laughs> I should have gotten that earlier. I should know it by now. Thanks to Sharon Voss for being with us and being part of this work and to Ray Daniels, who today is our song leader. Today is the final Sunday of Bob Raymond's summer break, and we want to say uh, thank you to Rayford Raby, to his wife Martha, for their leadership during this month of July. If you're visiting our broadcast for the first time, we're glad you've joined us, and if you'd like to continue to support our visibility and search results, you may click on the red subscribe button that you'll see somewhere on your screen and follow the instructions there. Uh, you may link to our homepage at www.fpcedw.org and there in the announcements section you will find some helpful links like the link to this week's worship bulletin. You can download it and view it. It contains some song sheets they may not be entirely in the correct order this week, but they're all there, we assure you, and there are additional announcements. Looking ahead to this week, we know the Evangelism and Church Promotion Committee meets on Tuesday night, and our youth group will have a virtual meeting next Sunday. So if you would like more information about either of these meetings, you may contact the church office. Many of you continue to wonder about when we'll move to the next stage of our response plan, when we'll move to worship services of 50 people or so. And all I can say this week is we continue to work toward that goal, but we don't have a date yet to announce to you. So please pray for your session elders as we continue to discern the Spirit's leading in this matter. And meanwhile, please look to our homepage, uh, fpcedw.org, for the latest information regarding the life of our church. And now, may the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us share this peace with one another.
Good morning. Please stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship. Be alert at all times, praying that you may stand before the Son of Man. Shout aloud and sing for joy, for great in our midst is the Holy One. Let us worship God. as together we pray. Ever-living God, before the earth was formed, and even after it shall cease to be, you are God. Forgive us when we forget your sovereignty and live to please only ourselves. Break into our short span of life and show us those things that are eternal, that we may serve your purpose in all we do. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. I declare to you that in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Amen. You may be seated. This time I would invite all of our children and those young at heart to join me for the children's sermon. In today's scripture, Jesus tells the listeners a story. Jesus tells us that the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. So, this person finds treasure, buries it, goes and sells all the other things that they might own, and buys the field where the treasure is in, hidden. What do, you, what do you think the treasure might be? Well, I have a few items here that, that it could be. Let's, let's take a look what it might have been. Oh, I've got some change. Maybe it was money. Do you think the treasure was money? Well, if it was, why, why didn't he spend it? And why did he sell all the other things so that he could buy the field with money? If it was money, oh, that, that doesn't really make sense, does it? Uh, no. 
Maybe, maybe it was something else. Maybe it was something that couldn't be spent. You know, what's, hmm, what's more precious than anything else? Maybe, maybe it was his favorite dessert. You know, I, I love cookies. Do you think it was cookies? Hmm. No, that doesn't make sense. Cookies get eaten, or they go bad. They get crumpled up and smushed in the bag, and then they can't really be eaten. No, food or dessert couldn't be it. Well, what could the treasure be then? What would the treasure be for you? Hmm, you know, I think it depends on who the person is. You know, if the person who finds the treasure is us, then the treasure must be Jesus and the kingdom of God. And if the person who finds the treasure is God, then that treasure must be us. Think about it. Jesus gave his life for us because God loves us so much and has created all of creation to be good. And therefore, God gives even the Son, Jesus, so that we, creation, can be with God forever, selling all all that God has to have us. You know, and I think that maybe if we are the ones who find the treasure, and the treasure is Jesus and the kingdom of God, it means that nothing in the whole wide world, in this whole universe, not money and certainly not cookies, so even if they are tasty, could be a bigger or better treasure and that the love and grace and hope we find in the kingdom of God is so much greater that we should freely give of the worldly treasures we have so that we can delight in all of the beautiful gifts that God gives to us. It is so rare and it will last forever long after that field has died away long after all of our earthly money and toys and desserts are gone. You know, it sounds really hard to choose the kingdom of God, something that is in a field and perhaps hidden, perhaps hidden in our hearts, over something that is right in front of us like a cookie. But I bet we can help ourselves and each other remember God's gift by sharing God's love and grace with everyone we meet taking time to read God's word, the Bible, and taking time to pray to God. Let's do that now. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the greatest treasure ever, you. Thank you for loving and treasuring us and for caring for us. Help us to remember how much you love us and help us to love you with our whole hearts, minds, and bodies. Amen. Please join me in the prayer for illumination, which you can find in your bulletin this week. It's a call and response. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from Make us hungry for this heavenly food. That it may nourish us today and raise us eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Amen. Today I'm conducting a kind of experiment to determine whether a travelogue can be successfully blended into a 
faithful and relevant sermon. Originally, much of what I present was intended to be a presentation for the Presbyterian Women's Luncheon. Uh, instead, it's now been modified a bit. And it's my prayer that through a look into my personal journey, journey the Holy Spirit may bless you with insight about your own. Today's scripture reading is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verse 44. In one of his shortest parables, just 32 words in our translation, Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. My recent trip to Michigan to work on details related to my mother's estate and to move furniture had another purpose. At each step along the way, I carried with me in my SUV a crate with some carefully bubble-wrapped objects. They were all nearly identical, and they looked like this. They are, uh, of course, shadow boxes. This is a shadow box. And the shadow box contains a few photos and relics related to my trip last summer. These relics are specifically from the abandoned farm of my father's parents. I've included latitude and longitude coordinates in the shadow box for all of my uh, cousins and distant family in the hope that a future relative may someday find and visit this place once again, a place that was almost lost from our family's collective memory. There is in this box a brick shard from the collapsed fireplace that surrounded my grandmother's stove. And above it, there's a painted stucco-covered portion of the interior wall which a little bit of distilled water revealed to be a beautiful light blue in its color. What may today be meaningless ruins to the current locals of this village turned out to be my own personal treasure in a field. It's quite natural for me to associate this experience with today's New Testament reading. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid, and then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has, and buys that field. Perhaps the farmer was a tenant whose plowing blade struck a jar containing some kind of long forgotten treasure. Like Therese and I, he wasn't looking for this particular treasure. He simply stumbled upon it. The treasure comes as an unexpected and life-changing event. Looking now at the screen, you will see a collage, and in that collage, the story of my father's family is summarized. Happened to be a very helpful tool for interacting with people in a country whose language I could barely speak. There's a map of Northern Europe in the background. I know that those of you at home won't be able to see it very clearly but the map forms the backdrop. And then red dots on the map mark the three general locations in which my father's family lived. And near each red dot, I've overlaid a photo of the family as they looked during the time that they lived in this place. 
it's a very long and complicated story. And so today I'll be focusing mainly on the story surrounding this easternmost right dot on the screen. The family records of the Hembrook family and the families with whom they intermarried began to appear in the 1820s along the Vistula and Boog River Valleys. These valleys stretch from the general area around Gdansk or Danzig along the Baltic Sea, upriver to Warsaw, east toward present-day Belarus, all the way to the Ukraine. It may surprise Americans to hear about Germans this far east, but it's quite natural to Germans to think of shifting national boundaries. At one time or another, Germanic languages and cultures have permeated the land from the Baltic to the Alps, from the Rhineland in the west all the way east into Russia. In a collection of poems published in 1796, Goethe and Schiller commented on this sense of indeterminate boundaries. Deutschland, ober, aber wo liegt es? Germany, but where does it lie? Ich weiß das Land nicht zu finden. I don't know where to find the country. During the 1820s and after a period of tremendous political upheaval, Polish nobles had regained some measure of autonomy. Ethnic Germans were actively sought to emigrate into these areas because they had the knowledge to drain economically worthless marshland and they supplied the labor to create from it prosperous agricultural land. The Vistula Germans, as they're sometimes called, tended to be evangelical Augsburger Lutherans in their religious orientation, and they maintained ethnic traditions and practices that were distinct from their Polish neighbors. The ancestors of my paternal grandparents settled in a general area just north and east of present-day Warsaw during this time. My first view of the Vistula River was from the airplane as we approached Chopin Airport. After touching down, we made our way to the Zentrum by train to the city center. We had to wait a couple of hours before it was time to check into our Airbnb apartment. We were located in the midst of buildings old and new. This is actually Google Poland over at the right-hand side of the screen. And we were on the fifth floor of an apartment building. We were just south of the old Museum of Science and Industry, which was a gift, so to speak, of the Soviet Union to the people of Poland during the 1960s. Some of the things we saw in the city in a very quick fashion included the evangelical reformed church, sort of the Presbyterians of Poland, the building dating from 1866 when someone in the treasury, probably originally Swiss, with a lot of wealth, sponsored the construction Calvinists were tolerated in Warsaw from 1776 onward. We saw the Evangelical Augsburger Lutheran Church of the Holy Trinity, which is sort of the mother church of this area, dating from 1782. We were at the old town walls, those date from just before 1500 the Old Town Square, much of this rebuilt since World War II, the Madame Marie Curie Museum, actually her home in that area. Therese loved all of the science exhibits there. And the equivalent of their Central Park, a huge, beautiful city park, not at all gray as you would think of 
the former Central and Eastern Europe as being. We were at the Chopin Museum. Some of our musicians would have loved all the multimedia exhibits there. They even have in a few places in the streets these uh, beautiful uh, musical benches where you sit down on the bench and press a button and it plays to you a, a Chopin tune. We are at Zygmunt's Column. This is uh, built in honor of the king who moved the capital to Warsaw, the column dating back to 1644, uh, like so many things, damaged during World War II and then rebuilt. But back to the journey toward family treasure. During this part of the trip, those discoveries took place in villages within a half day's drive of Warsaw. By one estimate, only 20% of people in the rural areas speak English. And so to aid our efforts ahead of time, we had hired a guide by the name of Renata, a journalist who also had been a tour guide for many years. Her English was very good and she functioned as our driver and our translator along the way. While I have no knowledge of the precise birth homes or properties of my grandparents and great grandparents, still I thought it would be good to visit the villages. We stopped in the village of Stanislavov. This is the birthplace of my grandfather Gottlieb in 1891. Alexandrov, birthplace of my great-grandfather Carl in 1837. It was only following the trip in an email exchange with our guide that I realized we had been very near the village of Grabi, which uh, is the birthplace of my great-grandmother, Rosalie, who was married to Carl. These villages all lie near the confluence of the Boog and the Vistula rivers, sort of be like being near the Missouri and the Mississippi confluence. With Warsaw down here at the bottom and all these villages just above, the distance between them probably no more than going from Edwardsville to Glen Carbon to Collinsville. Approximately 45 minutes further east along the Boog River, we arrived at the twin villages of Sadolish and Platkovnika. And these are the villages of my grandmother, Rosamunda, which translates rose blossom. Here in the rich farmland along the southern edge of the Boog River, her people, the Jabs, the Reutigers, the Rapkeys, lived from the 1820s until the onset of World War II in 1939. And it was in these uh, beautiful villages that the value of hiring a guide was proven. Our guide pulled alongside an older gentleman on a bicycle on a little village street rolled down the window and began to engage him in conversation, asked him whether he knew where the German cemetery was. He just happened to have had a mother who had attended the old Lutheran school next to that cemetery, which had been abandoned in 1939. But he didn't really want to guide us to the cemetery because he had fresh groceries in his bike basket. We just happened to have pulled over to talk to him by a home in which the owner came out to see what all the commotion was about and offered to keep the bike and the groceries in his refrigerator. And so after just a little bit more convincing by our guide, we found ourselves a few miles away. Through the windshield you can see the two tracks that are leading us out away from the main road, and deeper and deeper into the forest. Eventually we parked. You see Theresa's face. She looks a little apprehensive about where we're going to end up. And we walked perhaps 100 feet down a trail. 
And there we began to find the grave markers after 80 years slowly disappearing into the growing flo forest floor. Buried in this general area, we could not possibly find names on markers, are my second great-grandparents, the Jabs, my third great-grandparents, the Rapkees, and my fourth great-grandparents, the Evolds and the Wolframs. This particular grave I found a photo of from maybe 15 years ago, and it has a name nearly identical to my grandmother's, and I don't know the exact relationship yet. The graves are slowly fading away, but the growing forest around them is a lovely, peaceful resting place. Here's my only picture of the local man who helped out. And by the way, the reason he helped may have had something to do with Therese, who he seemed to like very much. He spent most of his time talking to her. The absolute highlight of this part of the tour was a visit to my father's birth village. In German, it's known as Lanschka, and in Polish, it's called Wonschka. You can see the L with the little line through it. In Polish, you pronounce that as a W, one of the many reasons it's a complicated language. Either way, that name Wonschka means Little Meadow. My father and his family lost their home and farm in the Little Meadow during the sudden onset of war. And so it was natural for them to think of and to tell stories about how this was a sort of Garden of Eden for them, the beautiful, fertile land of their youth stolen by war. And so it seemed to me on the morning that we arrived, which just happened to be a sunny summer day that rose to perhaps 75 degrees, we were met by a local who coincidentally also had the name Renata, whom my cousin Wally had befriended during the only other family visit we know of to this area back in the year 2003. At that time, this younger Renata was 17, and now she was a 33-year-old school teacher working in Warsaw. But her parents still occupied the family home that my cousin had visited 16 years previously. Our first stop was the German cemetery in which two of my great-grandfathers are buried. And uh, this is where the main entrance to the cemetery was. The gate is long removed. Just some of the concrete base there remains. But this is looking south through what would have been the gate toward the area that would have been the most populated long ago uh, across the fields. Turning around and walking just into the woods, Today's visitor finds only a few grave markers remaining and visible. Again, about 80 years after the ethnic Germans were forced off, ironically, by the Nazis. Incidentally, there was a huge population of ants at work during this particular season, and we had to keep moving very fast and brushing off our pants so that the ants wouldn't uh, get into our clothing. Only one tall wooden cross remains. A drive of a few kilometers south brought us to the Mog Mogjek farm. And uh, you can see tractors were out in the field, harvest was taking place. Over here at the left-hand side of the screen, you don't see much action, but that's the back of a delivery truck that's just arrived. Uh, with the daily bread. They, they make daily deliveries of bread in this area. It was my high honor to meet the oldest current resident of Wonschka. This is Zenobia Magziak, and she was a classmate of my Aunt Olga. 
She could remember things as her memory slowly warmed up to us being there in conversation with us. And she could remember that my dad once fell off of a seesaw and how frightened his sisters were to tell the parents because they were supposed to have been watching him. She also remembered my Oma, my grandmother, as an excellent seamstress and a godly woman. Therese had the presence of mind to open up her recorder on her iPhone and record most of our conversation in this place. And while we have it on our computers, we still haven't done much work to uh, translate it. The Hembrook place had been hand-drawn on a, a map uh, that was made by an original resident of Lanchka. He was trying to remember exactly how it had looked uh, in the pre-World War II era, and he drew this map in September of 1987. And here's the cemetery, and uh, going just a little bit further south, it's actually oriented with south at the top. Here's where the home of my, my grandfather uh, is marked. We didn't really need the map once we got there, though, because Zenobia and her family obviously knew exactly where my father's family had lived, and the remnants of the place still survive. A walk of three or four hundred yards into the field brought us to the abandoned homestead, and here we are sitting on the wall of what's called the cold barn. It's essentially kind of like a root cellar where it's dug out inside the foundation and you uh, store your perishable foods there. This gives you a little bit better view of the uh, cold barn wall and foundation. I took some markers with me everywhere that I went so that I could place the label and then accurately record the latitude and longitude. My intrepid wife ventured into the woods I've uh, often said that it pays to be married to someone who is a, a forestry professor's daughter. She's used to trumping in the woods. And to our great surprise, we found the actual home ruins in a stand of fruit trees. And uh, that's, that's the well. And then what looked like an uprooted aspen held concrete from the house wall. It's actually right at the edge of, of the house wall here. And the roots in coming up had just broken up a huge chunk of the wall there. So that's where I began to find the, the pieces with the painted tile. We found next to uh, the house and near the well a plum tree, which Again, brought back a memory of how my Oma enjoyed her plum tree next to her home in Flint, Michigan. Therese was amazing as she continued to dig and, and discover things. We found this large orange colored pile and eventually we figured out that this was the house chimney collapsed around the stove. Uh, metal portions of the stove still visible among the bricks. Nearby farmers were harvesting oats and hay, and I imagine this is the sort of vista my father remembered uh, from his childhood. Next, we made our way to the home of the local family, uh, that was befriended by my cousin back in 2003. We gave them uh, several gifts we had brought along, uh, little mementos of our area, gave them an invitation to travel and come to our house sometime. And we were treated to a lunch. This picture really doesn't do it justice. It's just one sample of things that were made right there on their farm or in the locale, various uh, meats and, and cheeses and uh, vegetable salads of one kind or another. We even tried to recreate some of the photos that my cousin had made uh, 17 years, 16, 17 years before and uh, place ourselves in a similar position. 
We found the location of the old Lutheran church. Nothing remains but the lilacs that probably were beside its front porch. And we learned that the building materials were used to make the local social services building, or maybe like the equivalent of our Glen Ed pantry, which seemed like a, a pretty good use if, if no one else is uh, there to use the building anymore. We were uh, treated to a, a visit and a tour with the priest of a nearby Catholic church and our, our hosts did this to show us the style in which the old Lutheran church would have been uh, built. And I was particularly fascinated by the secondary building just outside and to the right of the main church. Their, their old church bell, which they had to bury to hide during the war. They had dug up the bell and then at some point I, I never quite determined they built this kind of bell tower, the bells up in here, uh, for their, their old church bell. And so this is my picture of a smile, just to say it was a very good day visiting a place I'd long dreamed about going. Friday marked the 100th anniversary of my grandparents. Here's Gottlieb and here's Rosamund with her tall brother Edmund and his uh, young sister Emma. And uh, so just 100 years ago this week, they began their new life on this field of dreams in the East. I've thought a lot about what they experienced from that moment onward in their lives. Five children born on the farm, the onset of war, forced departure in 1939. In the midst of war and its aftermath, they were temporary tenants. And when the remainder of the family emigrated to the United States, they became sojourners here in what for them was a strange land. Today, the only real estate that in some sense belongs to them are their grave plots, just steps away from where my parents are buried. Their story and my travel log now circle all the way back around to Jesus' parable of the treasure in a field. The point of the parable is that the kingdom of heaven is like the field that when people realize what a treasure it contains, they'll give whatever they have, whatever they can find to make the kingdom of God and the treasure of that kingdom their own. That's part of the spiritual lesson in my family heritage journey. And in this memento of the shadow box I've put together for my family, it reminds us that lasting happiness can't be found in our possessions. Even as one, in ones as precious as the walls of our family home or of the woods and the meadows surrounding our family property, in Tom Sawyer, Mark Twain wrote, there comes a time in every rightly constructed boy's life when he has a raging desire to go somewhere and to dig for hidden treasure. Jesus says, the longing for hidden treasure that seems within the grasp of just a very few people may be fulfilled by all who place their trust in him and find at last in God's kingdom an eternal home. Thanks be to God and may it be so for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
Please stand as you are able and join me in the affirmation of faith found in your bulletin. In everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant, like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home. God is faithful still. Amen. Please be seated. This time I would like to call you to consider how you might give of yourself to Christ and to the church. A reminder that your donations support our mission to be Christ for the world today. We encourage you to use the giving tool on the church's website or to mail a donation to the church address. And now let us hear the musical offertory today. In our prayers today, we remember concerns of our community and nation, those who deal with distress in one form or another, those who seek to address injustice and unrest. We offer prayers of intercession for many specific individuals. Among those with medical concerns, we're pleased to say that Lois Noto has been released from Rosewood following uh, some rehab for her devastating fall and its injuries. She's now continuing her recovery at her daughter's home. We ask that you please add to your prayers Art Stonke, who is at home and under hospice care. 
If you would like to participate in the Ministry of Prayer, then you may contact our office for access to our full list of prayer concerns. And now the Lord be with you. Let us pray, first in silence. Almighty and gracious God, sometime this summer season, perhaps in the cool of an evening, when the heat of the day has faded to a tolerable level, we find ourselves reflecting on what an unusual year of change it has been. With routines disrupted by pandemic, and many we love necessarily at a proper safe distance, we wonder what new events and procedures may yet come our way. Faced with unexpected change, we look to you for stability and guidance, as have our mothers and fathers. In such simple gifts as summer produce or a visit to a farmer's market, we're reminded to be grateful for the fruits of the earth and all good gifts from your hand. Today, hear the prayers of your people as we intercede for those who confront illness and grief, poverty and hunger, crime, and violence, all those within our families and household of faith whom we have mentioned before you or remember. We pray for all who daily give energy to service and leadership in whatever capacity that is important to sustaining our communities. Grant to those engaged in this work the grace to know what is true and right, and give them the courage and the strength to do it. Teach us all, O oh God, the lessons of the treasure in the field, to remember that it is not by material gifts alone that we live, but also by the sustenance that comes from a relationship of trust in and obedience to you. Grant to us and to all those for whom we intercede the spiritual and material resources that create an abundant life characterized by joy, health, and freedom. Through Jesus our Christ, who taught his disciples when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
to serve the Lord. And as we go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen.